Great. It's my great pleasure to introduce and make you familiar with the strong gravitational lensing as a probe of dark matter. So my name is Simon Beer, mainly work now at UCLA with Daniel Gilman, a PhD student sitting in the audience, Tomasa Troy, and uh, last year at ETH in Zurich with Adam Amara and Alexander Refugier. I try to make, give you a broader review of what is the state today on gravitational lensing and then look a bit ahead what may we expect from gravitational lensing in the next time scale of years actually. It's really fastly approaching. So to set the scheme, here is a simulation with three different dark matter models. You can come up with others, your favorite ones. And in particular, on larger scale, as we have heard from Drew, we have a very good idea what structure formation is actually. On smaller scales, however, here in terms of single halos or single galaxies and the structure underneath it, these models can vastly diverge in their prediction powers. So we have different types of substructure, different shapes of those, different distribution. And if we could image that, we could refer back to actually to rule out certain model and learn a lot about what's actually the physics underneath that drives that. And strong lensing is targeting to somehow imaging these kinds of distribution in uh, single galaxies. That's the aim. So what is strong gravitational lensing? So here I give you uh, an image, HSD data, of such a strong gravitational lens. So this has been modeled by various people, uh, intensively modeled. And what you see here in the diagram, if you have a very small source, like a quasar, almost a point source, it gets deflected by a foreground perturber here, this massive elliptical galaxy, and you see multiple times the same image appearing here, these four dots, which basically represent the HSD PSF. If you have extended sources, such as galaxies, these get deflected by the exact same uh, lens, and you see them highly distorted, such as Einstein rings. And so the combined of those gives you such an image. And the observables here we have in hand is image positions, or where is the light, and time delays as a second component. So you have different arrival times from the photons traveling at different parts, either going upwards or downwards. So this is the observables we deal with to actually infer what's behind. And what can we learn about? Here's just a diagram of it in a more uh, geometric uh, line. And there are two main key aspects we can find out something about our universe with these two. The first, and this is the talk uh, I'm going to talk here, is about the mass that actually bends the light. And here's really the total mass. We don't care about whether this is luminous or dark. It's just matter that bends light according to general relativity or also your favorite uh, divergent theory from that. And the second part, just keep in mind, is also a geometrical aspect. We either have to assume or model or can be used as a probe act to basically probe the expansion history of the universe. So these are key features of strong lensing. So going back to our topic, so we would like to figure out, okay, what is actually the lens? And here just put that sketching. We have that data. We have a lens, which we don't know. And we have a source, which we also don't know. And all together, this leads to this image in that case. And these kind of clumps have, I'll show you, impact on actually how the data looks like. So we're sensitive to these small perturbations. And this has been suggested, and the pioneering work has been done in the early 2000s by various people, also including people here in the audience, to propose this actually being a probe to quantify the substructure in uh, gravitational lenses. Later on then, people have put this into action and actually done work, have detected these clumps and will go a bit through this uh, recent work and then look where, where we are going to. So mainly in, in the past, there are two different uh, methods that have been applied uh, to this. And first, before we go, we, I would like to illustrate here by uh, a movie done by Daniel Gilman which you show here is one image, or one image which is original source size is 20 parsec that's been strongly lensed, so highly distorted. And what we're now going to do is the movie will put a, a substructure of 10 to the 8 
and it will render them through it as it passes through the object. And you see how the objects change, and you see here how its magnitude is changing. So you see it coming. This is the generic effect we expect from clumps here of order 10 to the 8 to happen in actually our data. Here, just keep in mind, here is a milli arc second scale, so the entire slide here is about an arc second, so it's very high resolution, but the integrated light that's been measured here has been varied by about a factor of two, actually, whether a clump was present or not. And depend, and I or Daniel could run these simulations with different configuration, and the observables change in particular with the source size. So smaller sources have different effects on these types. Larger sources sometimes become even not affected by uh, these perturbations in terms of the total light. The clump mass, that's what we're also what we're interested in. And the clump profile, so it comes to self-interactive dark matter, etc. So all these things come into that lead this, uh, to change the observables and their <coughs> also the generacy involved in there, how to produce these observables. So there are two methods to actually analyze what kind of underlying dark um, matter uh, profiles there are in clumpiness. And the first one has been known as quasar flux ratio anomaly. Here we look at unresolved strong lenses. So what we here have is the strong lensing, I should show you in the image before, but we could not resolve it. We just measured the brightness of effectively a point source. And here is an image where, we base, uh, where this is done work by uh, Anna Nirenberg, um, where she analyzed how much flux come from each quasar. And what she then did here, as an example, she could exclude regions around this point where we measure this light, where a subclump would have perturbed the magnification too much. So you, this is a statistical argument of where certain clumps could be of certain types. So the Really nice feature about here, it can probe very small subclumps. So it's sensitive, so the relative magnification of images is sensitive to very small clumps. Comes to a cost, and this is a statistical statement we make. We need more samples and statist uh, rigorous statistical analysis to tell what's really happening. Here it's just in terms of an exclusion, but if we want to know what actually dark matter is, uh, we have to go through the full statistics of it. So this is quasar flux ratio. So here also like, Leonidas is being mentioned here, and then work by Nierberg and many others have done work on this area. The second method is gravitational imaging. That's uh, over. And that's been also mentioned by, by Drew already, have basically showed the same slide. So what we do here is the resolve the same game, but now resolved. So we have a larger source, a larger scale, but this perturbation gets resolved in the imaging here. HSD can be done by, with adaptive optics on CAC or with ALMA interferometry. These are the, the, st the stakes we have in hand today. And so we can then basically directly detect uh, through lens modeling whether or not certain clumps are present at specific regions with specific masses or even maybe even specific profi profiles. So it's really individual uh, detections are possible. On the other side, it comes a bit, the quantification of a detection is challenging. When is there a detection? So you require a lot of signal to noise. If you have like a one sigma detection, etc., it's highly degenerate. So we need a lot of signal to noise. And so the sensitivity to actually claim rigorously that there is a detection so is, a mu is uh, high. So, and it also depends on the mass definition. So it is 2 point times 10 to the 8 within 600 parsecs. So maybe a 10 to the 9 halo in terms of uh, uh, if we talk to uh, simulating people. And the sensitivity highly depends on the spatial resolution of our data. Well, I've shown you. If you have micro arc second resolution, you can do amazing stuff. And not only it's the resolution, it's also the source, how clumpy the source is that actually predicts uh, these different features. So this is work done people like Simona Vegetti or uh, Yasher Hetzavi uh, have uh, worked on that and uh, successfully detected signal clumps down to these levels. So uh, then a bit to my work, or that I have much, I mentioned it, two plus, 
So it's, it's gravitational imaging. So I'll show you first a, an image of a, where a lot of clumps are present. And if there's not only one clump, but maybe a dozen clumps present, smaller, bigger ones, it's hard to forward model and to reconstruct all of it simultaneously. So we've chosen a different part by we extracting features. And what I, I mean by feature that is basically, in that case, we, we run through that uh, data and we looked for regions where a clump would be preferred to be added to the model or whether it gets worse if we add a clump. So it's a scanning process where whether on certain regions the data tells us there's some anomalies which by a smooth model cannot be captured. So this is such a feature map. And the first hand we clearly see there must be structure beneath what we could model with a smooth model. So something is going on at the lower scales. There's not so much more information here that I can tell you where a clump is, how massive it is, what kind of dark matter model is the correct or the wrong one. We come to that, how to do the inference. So these features allow us to push to the sensitivity limit of our data. Wherever even small things happen, it may be pop up a very tiny uh, difference between with a clump or without a clump. And this type of analysis does not rely on the specific model of what actually the mass of a clump is, how many clumps are there, etc. It's a general, uh, there can be a thousand clumps in there, there can be one or two that causes that. It doesn't rely on that. And then the next step is then really how we make sense of what we do with these features. And here it comes to simulations. This is that part. We back up everything here with thousands of simulations. And how we do that, we have to take a physical model that you prefer. Here we use a free streaming length of a dark matter particle. We turn them into a stochastic model. So each of those represent different free streaming ranges or thermal relic masses. And we generate thousands of these models with arbitrary positions of clumps somewhere positioned in the image. We then turn all of these models into fake data, simulated data. And they all look by eye indistinguishable. So very small features. We try to match all observables, image positions, a word, a flux comes, very, very close to the data. And then we do exactly the same. We say that's, we're looking for the features exactly the same way as we did it on the one single data. Just do it on thousands of these simulations. And these are these feature maps, if you wish, from the different stochastic realizations of different dark matter models. So, and then we accept or reject simulation based on summary statistic. So we choose a statistic that say how different are these? None of them are 100% equal. But by eye, you may see, okay, this has maybe too few features to match that, maybe somewhere else, etc. And this is, we do through the framework of approximate Bayesian computing, which is purely Bayesian. You just have to run a lot of simulations to do it. So, and what is the result? And here for this one single lens, and this is um, my next slide. And these are the posterior region. Here, this is the dark matter thermal relic masses. And here, another nuisance parameter, if you wish, the entire mass of the, of the, of the halo it's in. So that amplifies either more or less the substructure. And what we could do here is basically exclude, if you marginalize in this way, for about 2 kV, um, uh, it's been included here. So roughly these guys are to 2 sigma in consensus with our analysis. And if you go up, it becomes uh, consistent. And with uh, the context of what already Drew told us a bit through other probes to, to get a, a comparison where we are now here, this is a Milky Way satellite. It's a bit higher here in, uh, for the 2 kV exclusion li limit and the Lyman Alva forest. Here I put in the 3.3 line. There, there are lines are going higher that relies on astrophysics. And this probe does not rely on any astrophysics in its analysis. If it relies on astrophysics, it relies on how we put them into the simulations. So we may, uh, so the focus here is really getting the simulations accurate and then run through the pipeline. And so to wrap up, just to summarize here, so I hope I have convinced you that strong lensing is a unique probe to test different dark matter models. So I've demonstrated what we've so far done is we've a warm dark matter thermal relic mass. We can put in black holes. We can put in self-interactions if we know how to do it and can just run the same analysis on that type of lenses. Dark 
substrate has been detected down to 10 to the 8 to 10 to the 9 in, in, in halo mass. Depends a bit on what is your mass definition. And the statistical signal can go down to 10 to the 6, 10 to the 7. So this is really interesting regimes. So 2 kV is basically sort of in that regime. We can extrapolate that of what we can get in the next few years. Statistical constraints so far, what I've presented here is about 2 kV. One single lens, an optical imaging. And we have the modeling and inference methods in place uh, to go further. So extension of other dark matter models, this is in progress, this is we are thinking, that's also why we are here and try to interact with you, what's actually interesting. And also combining these methods, so you have the point-like sources, you have the extended sources, they're in the same lenses so we can really uh, go forward in our statistical analysis that improves. And, last but not least, the sample of high-quality HST images is Im increasing fastly. So, uh, basically, right now, we got the email like yesterday, your target is being observed. <laughs> you know, we, we are getting these data in and, and we expect like a significant sample within, within a year and, it, and its analysis being done. So, uh, stay tuned for the people here uh, in Southern California. There's a lot of effort to, to, to push that forward and hopefully get very interesting results out our combined uh, power through simulations, modeling, data analysis. And that's how I want to close here and say thank you very much.